Hi everyone! Good day to you. This is Dr. Mary Rose Birendon, your NPP Medical Coordinator. So I hope you're having a great time and uh, really learning from the different modules that you have taken up since last week. So you have already learned about TB screening, TB diagnosis. Now, this module will discuss what healthcare workers need to know upon diagnosis of tuberculosis. So we will cover initiation of treatment, monitoring of treatment, and assignment of treatment outcomes. In our previous MOP, this was formerly called case holding, but now it is currently simply referred to as TB treatment. So the objective of treatment is successful treatment of TB, both DS and DR. So when we say DS, it's drug susceptible, and when we say DR, it's drug resistant. But this module, um, which I will be discussing today, will focus more on DSTD, wherein the program target is that 90% of TB DSTB patients initiated treatment, successfully complete treatment. Or this is also known as the treatment success rate. So for our learning objectives, um, we have the following. It is to assign the correct regimen and give the correct dosage for the DSTB patient. Monitor the patient during the course of treatment. What clinical progress should we be looking at? bacteriologic status and treatment adherence, determine the appropriate treatment outcome, manage initiated treatment by a provider outside the facility, and manage patients who interrupt treatment. So for the policies, um, the following are the policies of the NTP program, specifically on the DSTB treatment. So first is that all diagnosed DSTB cases shall be provided with appropriate anti-TB treatment within five working days from sputum collection. So turnaround time of collection of specimen to treatment or to initiation of treatment is ideally within five working days because um, it is that very specific period of time wherein we really can catch the patient and we really can start the, the patient on treatment immediately. And it, that patient will become no longer infectious the earliest possible time. Next is, the standard treatment for DSTD shall be given based on, again, results of expert MTB or MTB RIF. So we have learned that in the previous MOP, the SSM was considered as the gold standard for diagnosis, but now we are already uh, moving into expert um, MTB RIF detection. So the basis for treatment is again expert test. And if um, the expert uh, test or any other DST is not done, then it will be now the history of treatment that will be used as the basis for the regimen. So later on, we will discuss further about it. Number three, we have the quality of anti-TB drugs shall be ensured by ordering from a source with a track record of producing first-line drugs according to WHO prescribed standing standard quality. So this is um, particularly true, especially for those LGUs who are procuring their own anti-TB medications. Um, but for those um, who are in the program has provided, definitely um, it follows the, w, the WHO um, standards. Fourth is treatment adherence um, shall be ensured through patient-centered approaches. Again, um, it, this was the very first topic that we shared to you about patient-centered care. This is, this is a unique um, feature of 
our sixth um, MOP, um, wherein it emphasizes here that even family members can be um, allowed to be treatment partners of our patients. So it doesn't only um, it doesn't only include um, the HW self workers, community leaders, but now uh, family members are already allowed. Okay. The fifth is um, treatment response shall be monitored to follow up the SSM and clinical assessment. So um, the diagnosis is expert, but when it comes to follow up, the SSM will still be done. And um, all adverse reactions, or what we call ADRs, shall be reported using the official reporting form of the FDA and managed accordingly. So we will have a separate module on the ADRs, and we will be discussing that in thoroughly. Um, but uh, what we would really like to um, emphasize is that um, healthcare workers, we really are encouraging you to report uh, adverse drug reactions um, to us, no, and using the FDA form, uh, because that will um, really help um, in 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 future researches or policies of the program. Seven, TB patients shall be offered provided initiated provider initiated HIV counseling and testing according to the phased implementation of the TB HIV collaboration. So this is. Um, uh, we are already doing this. Um, however, um, we will not be discussing PICT in detail in, in this module. However, if, if you are interested or many of you are interested on in how PICT is done, then um, maybe that's one thing that you can feedback us so we, we, we would know. We would know if um, a lot of you are interested to know about PICT so we can make a separate module for that. And for number eight is that TB patients aged 25 years old and above shall be screened for diabetes. So now we are already integrating TB, HIV, and DM um, collaboration in terms of management. Um, so it is mandatory that for your TB patients aged 25 years old and above will immediately be screened using uh, for diabetes. So you can use... Um, the field pen um, protocol for screening for screening for diabetes. Okay, so now we will um, be discussing the procedures no, or the seven different steps and special situations during treatment. And the first step is initiation of treatment, including selection of the appropriate regimen. So that is really the first um, thing that we have to, to determine once we diagnose a patient having a uh, drug susceptible to it. Okay, so let's start with initiation of treatment. So once a patient um, has been diagnosed with TB, it is important to um, inform the patient that they have the TB disease. Um, and it is important also that when we tell the patient that they have this certain, they have the, the disease, is we also back it up with basic information and key messages about the disease and its treatment. So, what are the key me messages that can be included? So, we can give a basic information about TB, um, duration of treatment, um, the schedule of clinical and laboratory follow up. Uh, for example, splitting follow-up, adverse events, so uh, as what I mentioned earlier, adverse drug reactions, if there's any, um, and the process of contact investigation, we have to inform the patient that we will also be doing screening or contact investigation of his close, con close contacts, tracing mechanisms, social and financial needs. So um, this may seem a lot, uh, but uh, during the counseling period, but this would be very important later on because uh, remember that uh, our treatment for TB is, um, would last six months. And if it's an extra pulmonary TB, it will be longer. So we really need the commitment of the patient 
and the family as well. So how do we gain that commitment? Is really to give them um, good information and reliable information regarding the disease, and also to to manage also their expectations, because in many occasions, um, some of of them would think that um, it's okay to to stop the medications when they're already okay, feeling better, but um, they don't know the consequences of it. So um, it's really very important to really start with um, giving these key messages. But um, Siguro, we would, I would just like to highlight now that when you give key messages, especially on the adverse events, you don't um, actually scare them of, of the adverse effects of the drugs. Of course, you can, you can tell them of what to expect, but uh, um, make it uh, make it. Um, to a point that we will not scare the patient and in turn, the patient will eventually not um, take the drug. And uh, also give assurance. Give assurance that whenever um, these adverse events occur, that you are there to, to help them and, and, you are, um, and you will definitely give um, drugs that will um, counter those adverse events or refer them accordingly if they need to be referred to a specialist. Okay. Okay. So, okay, after explaining to the patient, then it's time to, to do the baselining. So we determine now the baseline weight and record the baseline clinical findings or the TB signs and symptoms. Um, why is this important? No? Because again, um, we, we take the weight of the patient, the baseline weight of the patient, because this will be the basis of the dosage, of the drug dosage. And also the baseline clinical findings will, will also be your basis, our basis, to monitor the progress of treatment. That will eventually help us later on if the patient, uh, to evaluate whether the patient is responding to the treatment or not. Um, next is... Um, we now assign the appropriate DSTB regimen based on the results of the expert, or if not available, based on history of treatment. So the regimen to be used should always be based on expert. Um, we will now know if the patient is uh, drug susceptible or resistant to the thrombicin. If expert was not done, then history of treatment can also be the basis for giving a DSTB regimen. So, for example, since most of the laboratories are still not able to um, have the expert machine, so I'm sure that there are still a lot of the laboratories will still be performing the DSSM. But um, we really, since we, we really would want to transition to expert testing and we have provided mechanisms to ensure that even those laboratories who doesn't have expert machines will be able to, will be able to um, access the, the expert testing. We have our striders na alam ko po na they have their own schedules. They have their schedules in your RHU, so please utilize them and um, have a good communication with your nearest expert um, laboratories or RTDL sites. Because if possible, you want really to test these patients using expert. Okay. So before we go to the treatment regimen, we let's familiar, familiarize the anti-TB drugs or the first-line drugs or FLDs. Because later on, we will only be using this abbreviation. Okay, so um, HRZE, or, um, HRZE is H for isoniazid, or sometimes um, they use the INH abbreviation. For rifampicin, we use R or RIF. And then for pyrazinamide, we have Z or PZA. And for etambital, we have E or EMD. So now we look into the treatment regimens for DSTB. So regimen one, um, that the number, um, the number prior to the drug abbreviation is the months. You know? So when we say two HRZE, that's two months of the 
um, isoniazid or thrombazine, pyrazine and bidinid thrombitol, and slash 4 R, that's four months of isoniazid and thrombazine. Okay? So there are two regimens for DSTD. Um, if the patient tested positive to expert with rifampicin susceptibility, meaning um, the patient can still be given the rifampicin, then regimen one or two can be given. Okay, so um, one, um, once the expert test result comes into you, first you have to determine the rifampicin susceptibility. So, I believe that you were already taught on how to interpret the expert result. Okay, so, when the expert says that um, uh, MTBRIF susceptible, then that uh, the patient is, um, can still be given the rifampicin. And thus, regimen 1 and regimen 2 can be given. Why? Because both regimens contain rifampicin. So regimen one consists of a two-month intensive phase of four drugs. So I've mentioned that earlier. And a four-month continuation phase of two drugs, as isoniazid and thambitol. Whereas regimen two is reserved for extrapulmonary TB of the CNS, such as when you have meningitis and EPTB of bones or joints and it uses the same drugs except that the continuation phase is extended to 10 months. So actually, both regimen are the same, com comprised of the same drugs, but they just differ in the length of or the duration of the continuation phase. For regimen 1, you only give it for 4 months, while for regimen 2, you, only, you give it for 10 months. So, um, if expert or any other drug susceptibility test was not done, such as in DS DSSM positive or clinically diagnosed patient, those with no history of previous TB treatment of at least one month. So when we say um, uh, previous TB treatment of less than of at least one month, then you can cons still consider it as new patients. Um, Regimen 1 and Regimen 2 can be given. But if the patient has been previously treated for TB or at least completed the treatment for TB or the, has been given the TB treatment for more than a month, then they are called the treatment already or classified as retreatment, then all efforts shall be exerted to test with expert MTBRI. Okay, so again, I would like to um, emphasize that that for new patients without history of three TB treatment or for those patients who have a history of TB treatment but of at least one month in duration only, that, that will still be classified as new patients and can still be given regimen one or regimen two. Even if... Uh, expert or any drug susceptibility test um, was, was not done. For example, you only were able to do TSSM and then it turned out positive and then the history shows that this patient belonged to a new classification, no? new patient classification, then you may give um, regimen 1 or regimen 2. But if there is already a history of um, previous TB treatment longer than a month and they are classified as treatment, then to the extent possible, please do expert um, testing first prior to initiating the treatment. Okay, so for regimen 1, what are the eligible TB patients? So, PTB or EPTB. So, meaning extrapulmonary TB except CNS bones and joints. Okay? So, let us be clear on that. You can give regimen 1 for extrapulmonary TB except if it's CNS bones and joints because those three 
if that is the classic um if those three will be the um, diagnosis for EPTB, then immediately you give regimen two. But all else, all other EPTB um, regimen one can be given. So whether new or the treatment with final expert result. So if it's still rifampicin sensitive or rifampicin indeterminate. Next, new PTB or new EPTB with positive DSSM or clinical, clinically diagnosed. And expert not done or expert result is MTB not detected. So, ito na yung sinasabi natin kanina na if hindi talaga magawa ang, um, hindi nagawa ang expert but you have a DSSM positive result, then you can give regimen 1. And also, if expert result is MTB not detected, but clinically, you are really suspecting that this is TB, then you can clinically diagnose a patient and give regimen 1. So for regimen 2, this is particularly for extrapulmonary TB. So again, very particular ito doon sa tatlo, no? EPTB of the CNS, bones, joints, whether it's new or retreatment with final expert result, MTB rifampicin sensitive and MTB rifampicin indeterminate. And new EPTB of CNS bones joints with positive DSSM or clinically diagnosed and expert not done. Expert result is MTB not detected. So, glaring difference, you only give regimen 1 for PTB pulmonary TB. For EPTB, you can give either regimen 1 or regimen 2, but there is a specific um, specific classification that if it's EPTB of CNS bones joints, it's immediately regimen 2. Okay. So, um, all efforts shall be um, exerted to ensure that all retreatment cases are really tested with expert um, testing or with expert prior to initiation of treatment because we don't know no we might be we might be um, giving patients um, these first line drugs uh, not having that their expert result tapos matagal na pala silang um, resistant so Next. So this is important, the registration of TB patients. Um, to note, um, while um, history of, while it, we are not anymore using this as um, the primary factor for assigning the regimen because in the previous MOP, um, we, we used to determine the regimen nung meron pa tayong CAT2. We used to determine the regimen based on, um, based also on the um, history of treatment. But now, kung papansin niyo sa previous slide, wala na siya. But it, this is still good to know. And um, patients will still be assigned a registration group. So, hindi na siya basis as for her treatment initiation, but um, this will be used um, for especially when we decide, no, yun nga, um, you have to know if you treatment or new, we decide whether um, we have to uh, immediately initiate uh, a DSTB regimen for this patient. So, for new, again, um, for new, masasabi natin new yung patient if the patient had no history of TB treatment. So, wala talagang intake, no, first time to be diagnosed with TB. Or, um, there are those patients who have taken the anti-TB drugs but for less than a month. Like for example, um, patient A was um, started on treatment but um, just took the anti-TB meds for three weeks and then um, stopped the treatment already. So if that patient comes back to you with that history, then you will still consider that patient as a new patient because um, 
he took only the anti-TB drugs for less than one month. So, siguro ang magiging um, magandang tingnan dito or clue, no? For new, never had treatment and less than one month. And next, for the treatment. For the treatment, we have five classifications. Five sub-classifications. So, um, these are patients. All, what's common um, among the five classifications is that um, they were treated before with anti-TB drugs for at least one month. So, umabot na ng one month and more yung pag-take nila ng drugs as compared doon sa inyo. So, the first subclassification is relapse. So, previously treated for TB and declared cured or treatment completed but is presently diagnosed with active TB disease. So, um, dalawa pong may kita natin dito, no? Previously treated for TB and declared cured or treatment completed. Um, siguro sasabihin ko na lang ngayon, no? So, review na lang ito, I'm sure. Cured is when a patient is a bacteriologically confirmed TB case. Meaning, talagang nag, may nagkaroon siya ng negative sputum. But for treatment completed, you assign this for clinically diagnosed TB na na-complete yung kanyang six months. Okay? So, ayan. So, basically, if a patient comes back again having an active TB disease but has a history of completing a TB treatment, then that is what you call relapse. Ano naman yung TAF, no? treatment after failure? So, uh, ito yung previously treated for TB but failed. Most recent course based on a positive DSSM follow-up at five months or later or a CD TB patient who does not show clinical improvement anytime during treatment. Okay, so, you can have two occasions for a treatment after failure. For a BC, bacteriologically confirmed TB case, who turned out positive on the follow-up DSSM at five months or later. But, and for a clinically diagnosed TB patient, who, one who does not show an improvement even during the, um, during, anytime during the treatment. So, what is treatment after loss to follow up? So, TALF, no? TALF, TALF. So, previously treated but lost to follow up for at least two months in most recent course. So, the patient only had um, two months of treatment and then, um, didn't continue and was lost, um, no, hindi na, hindi nyo na alam kung nasaan si patient. So, once, um, any patient who completed at least two months of TB treatment and then discontinued after, we consider that as treatment after loss to follow up. For previous treatment outcome unknown, these are previously treated for TB but whose outcome in the most recent course is unknown. So, pwedeng um, hindi ito na, na record ng, ng health worker kung saan man siya um, saan man siya galing or saan man siya nagpatreat in the past or the patient was not, hindi nakunan ng, ng follow-up sputum. So, hindi nyo alam if nag-cure ba talaga ito. Okay. So, yan. Yeah. And then, patients with a known previous TB history TB treatment history. So, patients who do not fit any of the categories listed above or previous treatment history is unknown. So, you give that um, category. So, ito siguro yung mga patient na medyo malabo yung history. Yung medyo um, uh, hindi clear yung kanilang history of TB treatment. Okay. So, now that you have already determined what kind of regimen are you going to give to your patient, then we will now um, assign the appropriate dosage based on ano nga yung sinabi natin kanina, what is the basis of the patient's um, 
of the drug dosage, it is the patient's weight. That's why we are, we are taking the patient's baseline weight. So for fixed dose combination, yung ginagamit ng program, but alam ko parang may mga binaba um, naggamot ang program na may single dose. So, um, either 2, 3, 4, or 5 tablets daily depending on weight should be given. So, this is particular for fixed dose. So, ayan. Andiyan na yung range of um, body weight uh, and then the um, drugs, the number of tablets that should be given to the patient. So, you will not have a difficulty on this. Um, you can print this out and put it in your desk. So, titignan nyo na lang kaagad um, what body weight range that your patient belong. So, what uh, what we would like to highlight lang dito, no, na um, the adult dosing would start 25 kilograms and above. So, if you, if you have a an obese child weighing more than 25 kilos, then you follow this dosing for adults na. Hindi na yung dosing for tibia. Okay? And then, since food uh, may interfere with absorption of some of these drugs, then you, we always um, educate the patient to take the medicines two hours after or 30 minutes prior to meal. So, yeah. Next. So, ito naman yung standard treatment for children using the fixed dose um, combination. So, before we still, meron pa tayong ganito, ano, yung dispersible tablet. Um, however, ngayon, this is not available anymore. So, um, the same way, no, um, ipapansin nyo, dito sa weight band, um, meron din tayong until 25 kilos lang, uh, until 24 kilos lang pala, rather. 25 um, kilos and above, you, you use the adult dosage recommendation. And the same din ito for adult. If an adult weighs less than 25 kilograms, then you use the pedia dosage for that adult. So for the pediatric fixed dose combination, they don't have, wala sila nung four, um, four tablets na combination. They only have what is available is the three drug combination, which is isoniazid, ifampicin, and pyrazinamide. So, the fourth drug, which is ifambitol, um, has to be given um, separately. And then, ayan, meron naman din nakalagay dito kung ilang tablets din yung ibibigay nito. Okay. So, if you want to compute, we also have this table um, this is especially true if you have the single dose formulations instead of the fixed dose combinations. So dosage per drug can be computed using these recommendations per body weight dosage. So I believe you know, the doctor should know how to compute this. So para hindi na po kayo mahirapan, especially for pediatric dosing, we have prepared this table for you. Um, computed na siya, no, based on ML. So, and since we don't have the syrup form of the ethambutol, so, ayan, nakatablet na rin siya. So, this table can serve as your guide as to, as the corresponding milligrams per kilogram dose um, will fall within the recommended dosage um, shown in the previous table. So, ito, madali na lang. For example, you have a child weighing 14.3 kilograms. So, the closest is 14. So, immediately, pwede nyo nang malaman kaagad na that the child can be given 3.5 ml of isoniazid, 5.25 ml of repampicin, and 8.5 ml of pyrazinamide, and 300 milligrams of uh, example tablet. So, madali na lang siya. You can simply go back to this table for your um, for your
for your reference. So you can also print this out and put it in your table. So it's important that when you give this, um, you also educate the, the parents on how to actually take the ML. Um, before, we used to give yung mga, we used to wash yung mga empty syringes, sterilize namin, para whenever may mga patients who need a pediatric dosing or mga syrup preparations, then the exact um, preparation will be given. So you can do that also. Now you compute for the total drug requirements. So um, it is very important for every patient started on treatment that you secure the total drug requirement for the entire duration of treatment. Um, ayaw natin yung at the middle of their treatment, eh, they will have to, to interrupt their treatment because they do not have enough drugs. Um, secured for them. So, kaya nga, di ba, when we, when we give the fixed dose combination per program, one box of CAT1 is really for one patient. We don't share. Kung naubusan tayo ng gamot, we don't get medicine from others, um, others pill box. We wait until there is an available category 1 um, kit intended for that patient because um, yun nga, we don't want that um, magkulang yung isang pasyente because kinuna natin for other patients. So, if for example, hindi available yung ating mga nakakit na, so, and if for example, we only have the um, single, yung mga naka, hindi siya nakapack, then, um, this will actually guide you on how to compute for the total drug requirements and um, know kung paano, paano kayo mismo yung gagawa ng kit for your patient since not all the time the program will be able to, su to supply medicines um, packed in kits. No? So, mas maganda na yung alam nyo na kung ilang tablets ka agad of the 4-drug and the 2-drug combination that the patient will be used for six months. So, this will be based on daily dosage per weight and the number of days of intake. So, we consider 28 calendar days no, per month sa computation. This is, um, this is with the um, assumption that uh, one month has um, four weeks. So, for example, na bibigay tayo ng example. For example, you have a 30 kilogram adult. So, 30 kilogram, dito siya pasok no, sa, sa body weight na to. Um, 30 kilogram will be needing 2 tablets per day of the 4 FBC for 2 months. So, you just compute na um, 2 tabs times 2 months times 28 days, that's equal, equals, that's equal to 112 tablets. And then, of FDC. And then, for the continuation phase naman, um, he will require uh, two tabs then. So, two tablets times four months um, times 28 days, that uh, that is equal to 224 tablets of two FDC. Okay. So, that's it. so, this is for regimen one and this is for regimen two. So, yeah. So ensure that once you have completed the total drug requirements, you now um, secure um, that drugs separately for the patient and put it in a plastic container or a box and label it properly. And ensure that when you store these drugs, no, they are in a safe, clean, or locked cabinet, hindi yung um, easily accessible to all Kasi, um, we, we would like as much as possible to maintain the privacy of each patient. So, kung nakasulat na yung pangalan and then anyone can get access to it, wala na, na, wala na yung privacy doon. Okay. So, ito naman yung sa children. So, now that you have already 
have the drug, you have already prepared the drug. Part of um, the counseling and even part of the history taking is we are always as the patient of other conditions that might affect the treatment. Now, this includes diabetes, HIV, malnutrition, and um, other drugs or other medications or um, other, uh, what you call that, maintenance medications that the patient is taking. Because um, this, all of this will, will actually affect the the intake of your drugs and the effect of the anti-TB the anti -TB drugs and the outcome also of treatment. So, later on, um, in another module, we will discuss you how to manage um, DSTB in special situations and also um, on drug to drug interactions of TB medications. So you'll know na ano dapat na iwasan na drug if ever may may tinitake si patient na nito. Okay. So as I've said earlier that um, HIV and diabetes are both risk factors for TB because of their immunocompromised state. So, um, having either of the mentioned comorbidity may increase likelihood of poor treatment outcome for TB if hindi po natin na-address ang kanilang comorbidity. So, again, we'd like to emphasize that all TB patients aged 25 years old and above will be screened for diabetes. And the cut of for diabetes is 126 mg per deciliter for fasting blood glucose and 200 mg per deciliter for random plasma glucose. So you can use pill pen protocol for this. So for treatment adherence mechanisms, we, also, we always um, discuss with the patient um, where is the most suitable location of drug intake and treatment supporter based on the patient's condition. Again, this will now highlight the patient-centered care. Kung dati, we always emphasize dots, diba? Um, doon sa health facility, tas dapat health worker. So now, we are actually giving more trust or giving the patient more responsibility to be um, accountable of his or her own health. So daily treatment can happen at home, in the community, or in the work, even in the workplace or health facility. And the designated treatment supporter um, can actually be an oriented family member. So, kung merong, much better if merong mga medically um, ano ba, inclined no? or medical professional in the family. But if not, then it's okay for as long as that family member can be oriented and can be given um, proper instruction. Um, it can also be a trained lay volunteer or a health worker mismo. Um, our DHWs. So the role of the treatment supporter is really to help the patient ensure that no daily dose is missed and to inform the health facility immediately if there are problems in adherence that needed that needed diba? that needed to be solved. So um, your choice of the location and treatment supporter must be a mutual agreement between the patient and the provider. Hindi natin po pwedeng ipilit. For example, you want OC, ganito na lang yung magbibigay sa'yo. So, we really have to ask the patient uh, kung sino yung gusto niya maging treatment partner. And if daily treatment in a health facility is not possible, then um, what we can do no, is we can provide initially, yeah, initially 
a one week supply to the treatment supporter. So, meaning good for seven days muna. And then, if nakita natin, and upon evaluation, na talagang nakakomply, na gagawa nila yung, yung, pag, uh, yung treatment. Um, so, pwede na nating ma-adjust later to a maximum of monthly dispensing, depending on the situation. So, um, pwede, mag, pwede ka munang mag two weeks na every week, and then if, if based on your um, based on your evaluation that they can be trusted. And so, pwede mo nang just okay, as your reward, I can give you your one month supply and then um, depending on the situation. So, during the pandemic, um, since it was a special situation, no, we were allowed to give um, up to two months of, of supply. So, um, whatever the frequency of dispensing, ensure, always ensure that the health worker or the trained volunteer will regularly communicate with the patient at least every two weeks. So this is really the key, the key word, the com regular communication with the patient should be at least every two weeks, not more than. Kung less than two weeks, pwede yon. Okay, better yun. Uh, pero para hindi naman masyadong makulitan si patient or if ever hindi naman ito masyadong makaabala, then um, we allow every two weeks. But uh, more than that, uh, we, we don't recommend dahil paminsan nawawala na yung, um, yung, yung connection. Nawawala na yung um, baka masyadong maging kampante si patient and hindi natin kaagad makatch yung mga needs niya. For example, meron na pala siyang naraman, nararamdaman na ADRs or adverse drug reactions pero because we were not able to communicate to the patient, so we catch it late. Or part lang din ng psychosocial support which is all very important also. Okay. So, for those naman na may access to phone or mga smartphone, so, that can, that mode of treatment supervision is also accepted. So, pwede video call or video DOT call or SMS. So, pwede yun siya. Okay. So, after that, you were able to um, give the patient already the medication. Then, the, per, the following pertinent recording forms upon initiation of treatment shall be um, accomplish. So we will have a separate module on this. So hindi ko na muna siya detail to be discussed in detail. So um, if your facility is, is already implementing TBHIB collaboration, so again, you offer PICT to all TB patients 15 years old and up. And if a patient with TB has a HIV positive mother, or if you can see signs and symptoms that may be suggestive of TB, then offer testing as well. So again, no, if you're interested to know more about PICT or if you want to implement PICT or TBHIV collaboration in your facilities, please do feedback the team so we can make a separate module on this. Okay. So syempre, since we want to be holistic, and yun nga, patient-centered patient um, care and approach, we also look at the social um, aspect of the TB treatment. So, as much as possible, we want that the patient will not take walang out-of-pocket expense. And also, yung facility providing treatment will also have, will also be able to reimburse appropriately to PhilHealth. Okay, so, we ask about the PhilHealth membership. Although now, because we are in the universal healthcare, Bawat Pinoy ay membro, bawat Pinoy protektado. So, um, makukover, makukover din ang patient. Okay. Um, we also ask if the patient requires any further social or financial support. Um, then we can refer the patient to either SSS, GSIS, or sa ating mismong mga DSWD or kung may mga LGU programs available. 
Now we go to the next, which is approach to TB patients initiated treatment by a provider outside the facility. So, ito po yung mga nanggaling po sa private. Mostly, ito, ito yung common um, situation, no? Um, this includes yung mga patients na unang-una ay hindi pumunta sa ating RHU kundi they, were, they consulted to a private facility or a private doctor or a specialist. So, and then eventually, um, that patient uh, goes to you because that was referred to you, no? Either na-refer siya sa iyo ng private doctor or um, the patient realized na hindi niya kayang bilhin yung gamot, so pupunta na lang siya sa RHU. That is the common scenario usually. So what you do is um, you you um, start from the basic pa din. You go history or history taking. Um, as a TB that's facility, you don't take as ano, a pay, at face value yung, yung recommendations. Um, it is also very important to take a detailed clinical history kasi baka mamaya may mga relevant history pala na hindi niya nasabi doon tapos biglang because you have good communication skills so mas na nag-open up si patient sa'yo and na-realize yun na ah, ganito pala, retreatment pala siya hindi pala siya new patient so mag-iiba na yung treatment regimen Okay, so always get start with a detailed clinical history following the same procedures as with any presumptive TB. Okay. So, as for copies, um, sh uh, syempre, kung mayroon siyang daladala ng mga supporting documents from the private facility or physician, so, mas maganda na matingnan niya rin yun or kung may mga x-ray results siya or may mga history talaga siya. Anything that will um, give you idea of the the patient's um, TB history, and if possible, if to the extent no na if the patient would allow, then you can get the contact of the physician of the private physician who's actually not a checkup or health facility, and um, you may contact or speak to to the provider. Um, para malaman nyo lang kung um, ano, yung, ano pa yung history ng patient. Okay, so, if wala namang supporting documents, then you will just really rely on the patient account. Just make sure that they are consistent. Okay. So, assess the patient's willingness and commitment to continue treatment under the program. So, um, Dito, you always, um, kasi iba't iba naman yung scenario, no? You always assess why did you not start your treatment in the private position or private health facility or pwede you started treatment and why did you discontinue and why are you coming here? So, yung mga ganyan. So, determine lang um, um, all these things because ito din yung magiging... Um, basis ninyo eventually or matatansya nyo if ito bang patient na to will be adherent to the treatment in the future or in the six months kung bibigyan nyo or not. So, do expert testing. no? If not done, so mostly if it's um, coming from a private facility, usually hindi, hindi talaga nagagawa yung expert. So, you you do it. You you collect sputum and then you send this, um, you send it for expert testing. Or if lalo na if hindi siya um, yung DSSM niya ay ginawa ng non-NTP recognized TB microscopy unit. Because um, if you are kasi an NTP recognized TB microscopy unit, you undergo the EQA. So, na-ensure natin na talagang quality yung, yung reading, accurate yung reading. Okay. So, the health facility physician, okay, your physicians, 
um, shall exercise best clinical judgment on deciding whether to continue, modify, or restart, or discontinue treatment. So, marami kayong pwedeng i-consider dito, no? The, the physician can consider the result of the expert, diba? You will be sending um, sputum for expert testing, so that will also be one of your consideration. You will also um, look into the patient's um, clinical signs and symptoms or response to treatment or if they are if there are ADRs, so really, um, we all consider this. We also consider the patient's history of exposure. Um, is the patient exposed to a DRTB patient in the past? Um, adheres to treatment also. So, um, that will now determine if um, you will reset the no, start from the first to the regimen niya. Or, i-continue nyo lang. So now, based on those considerations, you will assign the appropriate treatment regimen. And then, you have to accomplish um, now um, another set of forms and register the patient. So, in this case, the um, registration group for the patient is not trans in. Okay, kasi hindi naman siya transfer sa inyo. And if you have um if you have if you were able to contact that and previous attending physician or facility then provide feedback also to them. Okay. Now let's go to monitoring and treatment. So, how do we monitor treatment for DSTD? So, follow up. Again, for follow up, two weeks after initiation of treatment, then at least monthly thereafter. Okay. So, the recommended schedule of follow up checkup. Okay. When we say follow up checkup, not follow up sputum. But follow-up checkup, meaning the patient has to see you after two weeks, after initiation of treatments. So, and then monthly thereafter. So, the first thing to check, you know, the first thing to check when they go and visit you is the drug intake. So, you always, you now check the NPT ID card, titignan nyo kung everyday ba may firma doon sa, sa kanyang ID card. If if you notice there, there are missed doses, then you discuss with the patient and treatment supporter the reason why merong missed dose and, the, and recommend no, mga interventions to improve treatment adherence. Like, um, Para kung whatever is the reason why there, there are missed doses, that will not happen again. Okay. And then next, perform clinical assessment. So, ano nga yung ginawa natin nung una? We took the baseline weight and baseline um, clinical findings or signs and symptoms. So, every follow-up of the patient we always check for the clinical progress. So by by getting or asking the following, like monthly weighing, and ask if there are resolution of TB signs and symptoms. Um, also ask for adverse drug reactions, and if there are any adverse drug reactions, then we manage them accordingly. And we also check on the comorbidities nila if if the comorbidities have been controlled or um, hindi pa din and then do, will they have to be referred for their comorbidities? Same so, for the weight, be very keen with uh, changes in the weight because, for example, if there is really an improvement in the weight, no, nagkakaroon tayo ng, ng increase in the weight of the patient, meaning, um, the treatment is effective, then you may have to adjust 
or or add no add additional tablets from stocks to adjust the 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 needed dosage of the patient or if umapayat yung pasyente mas umapayat pa siya then you have to lessen or decrease the number of tablets accordingly So, dito na tayo, um, yung lagi nating sinasabing adverse drug reactions. So, um, adverse drug reactions are, um, we, have, we, we really have to reassure the patient. Um, yung sabi ko kanina nung sa una pa lang, when you inform that the patient has the TB disease, you inform the patient of the adverse drug reactions and that they really don't have to worry. And some of which are really expected, like for example, itong mga minor um, drug events natin. So for minor reactions, what you really can do is assurance, assure the patient that it's really part of the treatment. And you give symptomatic, symptomatic management um, and you don't recommend that they stop the drug. Okay, so continue lang because that is expected. So, what are the minor um, adverse drug reactions? So, some of the patients may experience gastrointestinal intolerance. So, uh, sometimes they would feel, um, uh, ano nga yan? Uh, discomfort. So, itong tatlong drugs usually ang um, culprit. So, you you give um, you may opt to give drugs at that time or if hindi talaga nila matolerate, matolerate yung without meal, then you can give them, um, you can give the drug with, with small meals. Um, next is, you also have mild or localized skin reactions or allergic reactions. So any of the drugs, the HRZE can give that um, ADR. So you just give antihistamine. You can give type in hydramine, you can give cetirizine, whichever is available. Orange colored urine. So, this is one thing uh, that's really common. So, again, that's that's due to the rifampicin drug and really there is, that is really expected. Diba? The sweat, um, yun lahat ng, ng fluid sa body would, would really turn orange colored. So, you just reassure the patient that that's, that's normal. Burning sensation in the feet due to um, peripheral neuropathy. So this is also very common for caused by isoniazid. So you can give pyridoxine or your vitamin B6 or uh, common sa atin is vitamin B complex. So you can uh, give that patient, uh, give that to the patient daily for treatment. Um, and it's can also be given 10 milligrams daily for prevention. And another minor um, ADR is the arthralgia due to hyperuricemia. So caused by pyrazinamide. So ito yung sinasabi natin, it's very important to note if your patient have comorbidities. Because um, not only HIV, diabetes, or malnutrition, but like ito mag arthritis. Because, syempre, if from the start pa lang mataas na yung uric acid levels, and then now you're adding these drugs that may increase the uric, uric acid levels in the body, then mas mag expect natin tong ADR na to, diba? So, um, maganda yung sa simula pa lang ay nakokontrol na yung, yung uric acid niya. So, and or manage na siya. And then, meron din flu-like symptoms uh, due to rifampicin. So, you just give um, antipyretics or um, symptomatic relief of the flu-like symptoms. So, for the major reactions naman, or major A ADRs, um, dito na tayo nagre-recommend na stop temporarily yung anti-TB drugs and refer the patient to a specialist if ever hindi niya na kayang i-manage. So, 
what uh, ano yung kasama dito si major severe skin rash due to hypersensitivity so yung kanina allergies lang konti lang manageable but ito um, severe skin rash so meron iba na talagang nagkakaroon na ng nagpipil na yung skin nagkakaroon ng scaly so kapag ganun na ganun na kasi yung skin rash na then you have to temporarily stop um the culprit drug and um, refer to a specialist. And jaundice due to hepatitis, so um, isoniazid or pampicin and pyrazinamide can be a culprit for this. So again, we stop anti-TB drugs and refer to specialists for further um, management. And then if symptoms subside, you can um, you can always resume patients for treatment and then monitor them. What else? For ethambutol, we have impairment of visual acuity and color vision due to optic, optic neuritis. So you have to determine prior to um, giving the drugs, part of which is actually to check for the visual acuity and also yung sinasabi natin um, yung Ishihara test. So, kasi baka naman prior to taking the drugs ay may ganun ng impairment ang pasyente. So, that mali, baka tas na-attribute lang natin siya sa drug. Or baka pwedeng slight lang or mild lang tapos nung uminom siya ng drug naging severe. So, that will also have to be taken into consideration. So, you stop the ethambutol and refer to ophthalmologist. If the patient experiences oliguria or albuminuria due to a renal disorder, so you stop the rifampicin and refer to specialist. And you also, we have psychosis, convulsion from the cytopenia, anemia, shock. So, again, no, um, when you see all of this happening, these are major ADRs the first thing to do really is to stop the anti-TB drugs and refer to specialists for appropriate management and treatment. So if there is a need to discontinue an anti-TB drugs due to a major ADR, so again, no, we only discontinue if it's a major ADR, but if it's a minor ADR, we continue the treatment and then we treat the um, reaction accordingly. So, once um, nag, uh, naging ma okay na, mabuti na yung um, kung anong pasyente, pakiramdam na pasyente, then we can um, consider reintroducing um, the drugs once again. So, this table illustrates um, a schedule for the introduction of TB drugs after an ADR using single dose formulation. So this time around, we will use single dose formulation, not the fixed dose combination. Um, kasi dito sa single dose formulation, pwede kasi natin, um, because the principle here, sa reintroduction, is to, in the, is to reintroduce the least culprit or least likely drug na mag cause ng ADR to the most likely drug para magkaroon siya ng sensitization. Ah, the sensitization. Okay, so, um, ayan. So, if the drug responsible for the ADR is identified, so, um, for example, if the occurrence of a reaction, malalaman nyo yan, no? Kasi, there will, yung, yung reaction will occur when you add that drug, then, at least, you will only replace one drug. So, that similar approach can be used for, for children. So, what you do when you, when you reintroduce um, anti-TB drugs, again, you, you give the least likely drug, na least culprit no, na pinahilaalaan nyo, yan ang one yung ibigay, and then with the following increment. So you may start at 50 milligrams and then day 2, 30 milligrams and then day 2, full dose. And then the next drug na naman. And then observe nyo if there will be reactions thereafter. Pero 
For example, if ang initial reaction pa lang ay severe na, then you may opt to give a smaller um, dose, like one-tenth of the doses given for the day. So, para talagang um, magkaroon ng chance yung body to adjust to it. Okay. So, next is, um, when do we request for a follow-up DSSM after um, among PTB, no? Pulmonary TB based uh, based on the schedule in the, the table. So, why do we need to follow up using the SSM? First is really to, to determine um, adherence of the patient to the treatment regimen. Kasi if, if the patient is really adherent to it, then we will expect um, a negative um, sputum exam or a decrease in the basilay na makikita natin sa sputum niya. And then, um, we will also um, clinically assess the patient and the ADRs and primarily talaga is bacteriologic monitoring um, by repeating the SSM throughout the treatment. So, we will expect a lesser bacterial load um, as the patient goes through the treatment. Okay, so, it is emphasized now when we do follow up, we use DSSM, the sputum, sputum exam, and not expert. Um, because yung mga new new expert machines natin ngayon can test or can detect positive even the dead bacilli. So it will continue to register positive microbacterium. So we use the SSM. Okay. So for a new clinically diagnosed TB case, ayan, CD means clinically diagnosed, new clinically diagnosed TB case, a DSSM follow-up at the end of the intensive phase, that is the end of two months, will suffice if it is negative. Okay. Wait natin yun. So, if, uh, if you're a new clinically diagnosed TB case, you, a DSSM follow-up is done at the end of the intensive phase or at the end of two months. And it will suffice if it is negative. So, pag negative na siya, second, second month, then you don't have to make another follow-up. You just continue the whole treatment regimen for six months. But if the reading or DSSM is positive, then DSSM must be repeated at the end of fifth month and at the end of fifth month. So in fifth month and sixth month. Yeah. For new bacteriologically confirmed TB cases or BCTB and all the treatment cases, whether bacteriologically confirmed or clinically diagnosed pa yan, sputum follow-up is done at the end of intensive phase or at two months, end of fifth month, and end of treatment, which is six months. So, what will be the action based on the follow-up the SSM result. So what, um, what should we do? So first, um, whenever follow-up DSSM is negative, just proceed with the treatment and no further action is needed. Okay? So, kung negative naman ang DSSM niya, then just proceed with the treatment and complete it until six months. However, End of if intensive phase, DSSM is positive, so meaning after two months, so positive shall sa DSSM, we now request for expert testing. So, we request ng ex expert testing and proceed with treatment pa din while waiting for the result. 
Okay, so while, while waiting for the result. Um, and then, pag, if the result is reef resistant, meaning refumpicin resistant, so ano nga yun? Pag when we say refumpicin resistant, automatically drug resistant PD na siya or DR na siya, hindi na siya DS. So the, the regimen should also be shifted to a DRTB regimen. But if the extra result is MTB not detected, are refumpicin sensitive or refumpicin indeterminate, we will continue treatment to continuation phase. However, we will request for TB culture and phenotypic drug susceptibility test if possible. Okay? So, ito na yung time na um, we can request um, TB culture. Okay. So, ano ba yung rationale? Why do we need to request for a TB culture or any drug susceptibility test? Um, because we will have to determine or give the possibility of monoresistance or ad other polyresistance without rifampicin resistance. So, although uh, mababa naman ang isoniazid monoresistance sa atin, nasa 6.2%, yun yung base, um, yun yung sa Philippines, no, sa base, um, base sa drug resistance survey. Um, Ideally, um, a rapid test for isoniazid resistance should be done to rule it out. And then, an isoniazid resistant regimen may be given if confirmed. Pero, since our yung country natin, wala pang ganong laboratory capacity, then the TB culture or phenotypic DST can be done. Okay. So, if positive positive naman it's ang DSSM okay if DSSM is positive on the end of either the fifth or sixth month that you treatment is stopped and patient is declared as a treatment failure so treatment failure na ang registration ng patient and then we repeat we repeat expert test and patient is referred to a facility with PMDT or DRTB services. So, um, it is very important that any positive DSSM follow-up should always trigger a review of patient's adherence to treatment. Diba kasi, we, we expect talaga that whenever the patient is adherence, adherent to treatment, mag-register talaga siya negative. But, um, maybe along the way, um, either nag-develop si patient ng drug-resistant TB or talagang hindi lang siya adherent sa treatment niya. Sinasabi lang niya lang na adhere. So, we, we have to determine that. Kaya, we always tell na every two weeks talaga we, the treatment partner, communicates with the patient or checks on the patient and binawin. So, next. Okay. So, ito. Very important din ito. No? Dahil maraming nagpapagawa sa mga MHOs ng ganitong um, medical certificate or work clearance. So, when kailan ba? Kailan ba ang patient be cleared for work or school? So, our basis really is when they are considered no longer infectious. So, for clinically diagnosed cases, they may be cleared after one week of uninterrupted, uninterrupted treatment. So, that is for CD, ha, clinically diagnosed. So, one week na tuloy-tuloy na treatment, then we can already clear them. Or they, we can already consider them as non-infectious. However, it would be a different case for a bacteriologically confirmed case. So we can only give clearance once there is a negative DSSM follow-up result. 
and a repeat DSSM can be done as early as two weeks after initiation of treatment. That is only for the term for the purpose of determining infectiousness. And this will not affect yung regular DSSM follow-up schedule. So hindi siya, hindi siya consider as DSSM follow-up. So if the patient as uh, registers negative for DSSM after two weeks of treatment, then we can all already clear the patient as non-infectious. And maybe you can already advise the institution or the patient that you can she can be can go back to work. Uh, and just uh, and just um, recommend that to continue treatment and follow up as advice. Okay, so all visits should be documented in the NPP TB card. So now, how do we manage naman yung cases? TB cases na nag interrupt ng treatment. Maraming ganito, di ba? So, ayan. We, we, we make sure to have regular contact or communication. Again, ilang weeks nga yun? Yes. Every two weeks. Even if treatment is done at home by a family treatment supporter. So, any interruptions in treatment should be discussed with the patient and treatment supporter and we have to give um, recommendations or advice para ma-address yung problem. And then, we always assess, again, the patient's needs for psychological, emotional, financial, or social support. And if kailangan po sila refer sa mga, sa ating mga DSWD, then we refer them accordingly. So this table now illustrates um, how to decide on patients who interrupted treatment. So for, treat for patients who interrupt treatment for less than a month, ito po, less than a month, that is, pag sinabi po natin less than a month, less than 28 consecutive days missed. So what we do is we continue the treatment and we just prolong it to compensate for missed doses. So since the patient missed 28 days, then we add 28 days doon sa kanyang treatment duration. Now, if interruption is more than one month but less than two months, perform DSSM. Okay, so mag-collect tayo ng sputum and decide now on continuation of treatment based on the result. So if DSSM is negative, then we continue treatment and we will just prolong um, to compensate for the missed doses. While if positive DSSM but if the patient is less than five months in the treatment, then we continue the treatment and prolong to compensate for missed doses. However, different po ang decision if the patient is already five months or more, manapit na siyang matapos sa treatment niya. Then we will now assign the patient as outcome as treatment failed. Pero if the patient interrupted for more than two months already, then assign now the patient as lost to follow-up. And then, we also exert all efforts to trace the patient because definitely that patient may still be infectious and may um, be a danger or may pose um, a threat to the community. And then perform expert testing and if nakitang um, drug resistant, then we refer to 3D na treatment center as needed. Okay. So now we will now assign treatment outcomes. So doon na tayo 
sa tapos na no tapos na nag treat si patient and we have uh, to assign now the patient the treatment outcome so what is the um the basis of the treatment outcome so first we we base it on the completion of the entire duration of the prescribed intake so if whether it's six months or whether it's 12 months for ATP. We also um, assign it based on the SSM follow-up. So, na mention natin kanina yun, no? And if there is clinical improvement. So, the following are the treatment outcomes for TB, for DSTB. So, we have cured, okay, you know? So, we can only assign uh, outcome na cured for patients who are bacteriologically confirmed at the beginning of treatment. So, we cannot use cured for clinically diagnosed TB. Okay, so, kailan po na cure si bacteriologically confirmed TB? Um, the patient has to have a smear negative or culture negative in the last month of treatment or on at least one previous occasion in the continuation phase. So whether um, at least no um, negative siya sa six month or negative sa fifth month of um, DSSM follow-up and then natapos na yung six months treatment, then the patient can be assigned to cure. For treatment completed, so a patient who completes treatment without evidence of failure but with no sputum smear negative results in the last month of treatment or on at least one previous occasion, either because hindi nagawa yung test or unavailable. So, ayan, no? this group includes clinically diagnosed patients who completed treatment. So, Clinically diagnosed cannot be assigned cured, but bacteriologically confirmed TB can be assigned cured or treatment completed. At what occasion can I bacteriologically confirmed TB case be assigned treatment completed if the SSM follow-up or sputum test was not done to a BCTB? Treatment failed. It is a treatment field. Okay. A patient whose sputum smear or culture is positive at five months or later during treatment. So, treatment failure yon. Treatment terminated because of evidence of additional acquired resistance. So, for example, may mga occasion, yung sabi natin kanina, ba? may mga occasion na pag nag-positive siya sa DSSM on the second month, we um, exert effort to have the, the patient tested for expert. And then, paglabas ng expert result, rifampicin resistant na pala siya. So, DRTB na pala siya. So, we will assign that patient as treatment failed for DSTB and then be enrolled on a DRTB regimen. Third, treatment failed also for patient for whom follow-up sputum examination was not done and who does not show clinical improvement anytime during treatment. Okay, so walang evidence of negative sputum and then wala ding evidence of clinical improvement. And also ito, severe uncontrolled ADRs. So for example, the patient developed a major ADR and then nag-resolve. And then slowly, you introduce the drug. Ginamit yung single dose formulation. However, now that you have reintroduced the drug, nagkakaroon siya ulit ng major or severe adverse drug reaction, the same. So, meaning talagang hindi, wala kayong pwedeng maipalit na drug because one, uh, two or more drugs are involved. Then definitely, the regimen is not anymore for that patient. 
So we will also assign that as different field. Okay. For died, um, a patient who dies, a, a TB patient who dies for any reason during the course of treatment. So whether it's due to TB or not TB, um, same pa rin po ang assignment. Died pa rin. For loss to follow up, a patient whose treatment was interrupted for at least two consecutive months. Keyword po, two consecutive months. So, nabanggit na natin ito kanina, no? Pag two months, more than two months na din, loss to follow up na siya. And then we also have initial loss to follow up. Initial loss to follow up happens if yung patient, we diagnose the patient as having TB, but we have not started the treatment. So, parang pag-start pa lang na treatment, hindi na matrace si patient. So, we have cases like this, so that is initial loss to follow up. Not evaluated. So, patient for whom no treatment outcome is assigned. So, it, this includes yung mga patients transferred uh, to other facilities for continuation of treatment, but um, the final outcome was not determined. Okay. So, not evaluated. So, yes, um, I hope that you were able to learn uh, or to gain insight on the treatment um, uh, module. And now it's time for you to take the exercise three for assigning, assigning appropriate treatment regimen and monitoring for DST. Okay, so I hope that you, you learn something and you will ace your exercises. Thank you for listening.